here we are on the five minute tunnel. Uh, they call it the five minute tunnel because literally the, it's a one way tunnel, a military tunnel built uh, for the war. And um, you can only go one way through the mountain and the traffic light takes five minutes to turn green. Okay, here we go through the five minute tunnel. You see the little red sign up there? Five minute light. Hey, welcome back. I'm out here at the Marin Headlands again, and I'm going to check out the Cold War Nike missile site here at the Headlands. And for those of you who don't know what the Cold War Nike missiles were all about, uh, the Soviet Union and the U.S. both had nuclear weapons, and this was our defense system in case the Soviet Union's sent bombers with nukes to bomb one of our cities. We had this net of these uh, ground-to-air defense missiles called the Nike missiles. They were built with, by Bell Laboratories and Douglas um, Avi Avi Aviation Division. And they, for the time, they were extremely high-tech. A radar system would um, see if there was an enemy coming and signal to the uh, Nike missiles and then special keys were used to verify the launch and then once they were launched they could track the uh, quadrant and they were actually nuclear armed and they would could be able to blow many planes out of the sky when they went off and found them so let's go check it out here's a old military guard here and he's kind of creepy. He's no face guard. No face guard. Here's the old original sign. U.S. Army restricted area. Warning. This reservation has been declared a restricted area by the authority of the commanding general. In accordance with the provisions of the directive issued by the Secretary of Defense on August 20th, 1954. Uh, you come through this gate back then, you get shot. <laughs> so, they have an actual decommissioned uh, Nike missile here, as you can see. And this is the once high-tech, now primitive operating system that anybody's cell phone is probably a thousand times more powerful than this stuff. And this is uh, some kind of power system for the Nike system. But these were nuclear capable. So this is some kind of propellant. Engine here. 
in the back where you'd be burned alive if you were standing here. Here's an old picture. This is uh, Rodeo Beach, and all this is barracks. At the Ajax uh, missiles, they weren't quite as powerful as the Nikes, from what I understand. Out of the propaganda, it can happen here. This is the government's way of supporting the Nike missile defense system. Launching area for the missiles. The radar downs. If you happen to go through that gate and the restricted area, uh, uh, thing one and thing two would come after you. Here's a poster. If you want to pause the video and read it, go ahead. They even have a they even have a toy launcher here. And Ravel even made a model of the Night Hercules missile. Another propaganda poster, Bert the Turtle plays duck and cover. Star of the official U.S. civil defense film, Duck and Cover. Bert the Turtle. And down below that, you get the horrific sight of an atom bomb going off in testing. Look at that. Can you imagine our nukes today are 100? times more powerful than that, if not a thousand times more powerful than that. Pictures of that on the wall here. That stuff must be toxic. The suits they're wearing, the fuel. This is a picture of the enemy bombers. So this was a radar aiming system. And um, you would have to stand up on this platform and look through with your eyes at the image and um, aim the initial missile and then this is one of the radars that would spin back and forth I'm sure you people have seen those in movies if it goes ooh, 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 and this one's constant looking for enemy and as you can see it looks pretty primitive by today's radar standards Look at that. As we speak, there is a military cargo plane flying over. That's pretty cool. Good timing on that, huh? I think they call those a C-12, I think. If I'm not mistaken.
These are the trucks that remove the missile. Trailer, low bed, guided missile, seven ton unit. And then the, the toxic fuel for the Ajax missiles would be poured into them here. And they would have to wear uh, highly protective gear. And look at this old rusted out uh, Jeep. That thing's cool, look at that. It's got a lot of patina on it, huh? Old vice here. I wonder what that is. That's interesting. Leave some, anybody know what that is? Leave some, some comments for me. But this thing is, uh, El Rustoed. I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. Look at the uh, instructions on it. Crazy. And then this would have been, I think, a booster? I'm thinking that's a booster. Uh, this is Nike Missile Site SF-88. Um, when this was an active military program, there were close to 300 sites like this one around the entire U.S. But this oh. is the only one that's um, restored and open to the is public. 88 this uh, particular one within 300 out of 300 it's in number well, 88 you know, I never or thought about that i think so okay yeah now how many nike sites were here in this marine headland this is it Two. okay so if you look across the way you yeah see that structure over there with what look like solar panels yeah that's now the marine mammal center that used to be a nike missile site oh okay mm -hmm. okay um so i'm curious uh what inspired you to come to the nike site today uh i grew up in marin county I used to drive by it, and then I was researching things to come and check out during COVID. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I was like, what? They give tours of it? I had no idea. Yeah. Because I used to drive out here when I was a teenager. We'd go to the beach, and, and this was always something of interest to me. I was like, oh, that used to be a missile site? Yeah. So that's why I'm here, because I was like, I couldn't believe you guys are doing tours. I yeah. thought that was really cool. <laughs> yeah. So that's what inspired yeah. me. Well, welcome. <laughs> Thank great. you. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes... I grew up in Mill Valley, so. Oh, cool. I'm so real close. close. By. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Nike is an interesting place. Sometimes we get visitors who just saw an open gate and they drove in. Right. And sometimes we get visitors who are military buffs and are super into the history. I'm kind of. I, I have that a little bit. My grandfather on his deathbed can confess that he had been in the cia whoa <laughs> like because he you know you can't tell people right yeah. but he knew he was gonna die and he said That's oh gnarly. i wasn't actually an industrial engineer i was actually in the cia my whole That's life crazy. and that kind of blew me away wow and then my my grandfather on my dad's side was he worked on p-51 mustangs in the world war ii which are the fighting planes oh, okay the ones that have the big teeth on the side that you've oh, probably whoa, seen yeah so I have military, military in my connection. family, yeah. yeah. Wow, very cool. Yeah, so I, I have an interest in it, but I'm not like a, I wouldn't call myself a military buff. Uh -huh. I like, it's interesting. For sure, yeah. Well, the Headlands is great for that. We have, you know, not just a Nike site, we have like a very rich military history going back to the late 1800s. Yeah. One of our older batteries called Battery Mendel. It's about, um, it's like a few minutes drive up the road from here. Um, it was built in 1905. And it was actually innovative at the time because it had a disappearing cannon that would rise out of place, fire. Right. Like they crank the crank yeah. probably. <laughs> and then it would like rise out of place, fire. And then it would like to reset, it would go back down out of the line of sight from the enemy coming at sea. Oh, wow. It was very innovative. Okay. 1905. Yeah. And then about 30 years later, um, 1938, Battery Townsley was built. I think you were asking about that earlier. Yeah, yeah. Um, World War II era, there was actually a prototype battery it was one of the first of its kind 
and innovative technology. It was armed with two about 70 foot long cannons that were capable of firing 2,000 pound projectiles about 25 miles out to sea. Wow. So extremely innovative for the time. That's like a car. Very powerful. <laughs> yes. True. Wild. Wild stuff. Um, but even that technology that we had here ultimately became obsolete by the end of the Second World War once atomic warfare was on the table. Yeah. So after World War II ended in 1945, it didn't take long for tensions to rise between the Soviet Union and the United States. The Soviet Union was establishing a communist regime and the U.S. was joining or joined NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, um, forming an allyship among those democratic nations um, and, to and vowing to defend those nations from any threat, including threat of communism. So up until that point, the U.S. had a monopoly on atomic bombs, um, but that monopoly came to an end in 1949 when the Soviet Union tested their first atomic weapons. Now, do you, is there a theory that they came up with the technology themselves or they got um, the information from us? What do you think on that? <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I don't have an opinion on it. I could go either way. I could see, I see both sides. Yeah, because there's a lot of um, espionage going on back For then. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting history. I wonder. Um, well, and then a few years later, in 1953, yeah. the Soviet Union tested their first hydrogen bomb only about 10 months after the U.S. So it was at that point... However, they got to that technology. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. very much this tangible arms race that was ensuing between these two superpowers. And of course, the Cold War, as we now know it, had begun. So this ultimately led to um, this fear brewing in, in the United States, the, the fear that atomic attack could happen really at any time. Mm -hmm. So it was this fear that inspired the bolstering of the U.S. military defensive systems. And hence, we had the, the building and the forming of the Nike missile program. So it was initiated in 1953, and by 1954, the Nike Missile Program came to be. Nike Missile Site SF-88 was active by 1954, and for about 20 years after that. Um, you may be wondering why this military program was named after a shoe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Nike Missiles actually preceded Nike Shoes by almost 20 years. So yeah. this was first. I imagine. Yeah. yeah. It was common <laughs> to kind of name military programs after figures from Greek mythology. Mm, mm -hmm. And Nike is the, the goddess of victory. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow, this is cool. <laughs> More stuff than I imagined. So this is the Warhead building. Okay. This is where the Nike Ajax was constructed. The Nike Ajax was the first missile model created by this missile program. And we can see an example of that here um, with kind of the inside view and then a whole one hanging from the ceiling above. This was the world's first surface to air guided missile system. The Nike Ajax was about 24 feet long, weighed, I want to say, 2,400 pounds. Is this the whole length of it or? This, this, and then the booster as well. Wow. Yeah, so the booster, this is like the main component. That would fall off? Exactly. Okay. Yes, after a few seconds it would fall off. Yeah. So this could reach altitudes of about 50,000 um, feet, and it could only travel about 30 miles. And I want to say its peak speed was 1,600 miles per hour, so pretty fast. Um, but even this wasn't enough, and a few years after they developed the Nike Ajax, they developed the Nike Hercules in 1959. And we'll be able to see an example of what that looks like when we get to the launch area. Is this okay. the warhead supposed yes, to be? Yes, this is the warhead. Yes, this is the bomb. Uh -huh. And this is the rocket booster, and then the, the front section is the navigation system. The Whoa. This, and then where was the, uh, like, the explosive? This right here. Oh, that. Yes, okay. and it was like a, a liquid. Looks like a watermelon. Um, <laughs> but, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> and then one other thing I'll point out in this building while we're in here. Um, so the Nike missiles were not designed to come into contact with their target. They were designed to explode okay. slightly in front and above their target. So mm -hmm. this was the planes. Um, their target was uh, bear bombers, just jet planes. They were designed to explode in front and above to maximize their payload. Their goal was to take out many planes, fleets of planes, not just a single plane. Okay. So of course, to do this, they would have to practice. 
Um, no Nike missile was ever fired from any Nike, ah! any Nike site in an act of defense, yeah, but they would of course occasionally have to practice. So to do that, they would be sent to um, the deserts in the Southwest to do their practice uh, firing, and they would use drones as the targets. And um, the drones that we know of today are not what they've used. The drones will look like this. <laughs> as you can see, target mm -hmm. is written on each wing. This is what they would be um, aiming at when they would do their practice fire. Yeah, I actually last night watched a movie that the military put out about the Nike missiles. Oh, really? On, oh. on YouTube, and it was really interesting. Because it was like a military movie, you know? Yeah. And they showed them testing on these things. Oh, great. Yeah. I've always wondered if it was like lore or not. Because like, we have a lot of um, volunteers who are Nike veterans, and we hear a lot of like different stories no, the, from them. There's official, it's an official army movie that shows the whole training process great. and the testing of them. Right. Like what you described out in the great. desert. Okay, cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, supposedly, and maybe this military movie can confirm or not. <laughs> Supposedly there's only two of these left, or very That I don't know. <laughs> yeah, um, makes sense, because they were exploded. Um, the Nike Hercules, or the Nike Ajax and Hercules missiles were very, extremely accurate. So I can imagine these were mostly destroyed. Hmm. And you said these were like the practice drones? Yep. Okay, cool, cool. Yes. So they wouldn't practice here. Um, they would be sent to, like, the deserts in the southwest to practice. So no one... No, no, no soldiers actually fired from like their home station, if that makes sense. Okay, okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Now, what's this doing? Oh, yeah. This is kind of a preview of what Nike Hercules is. This was the middle section that held the warhead. As you can see, this is pretty massive compared to this one. Wow. And we'll get to see a full Hercules. This honestly. is the front or the middle of this the This is the middle. There would have been like the, the pointy oh, end here. It's considerably bigger. It's huge. Yeah, it's about 40 feet long. And they, you said they were actually um, on cranes here? They'd be... Um, I'm not sure exactly how they use this rigging system, but they would. this building was specifically to construct the Ajax. Oh, wow. So when so they, they need them, they roll them. Wow. Yeah, and we'll, we'll put outside. And okay. Kind of. Very cool. These things are so primitive compared to <laughs> I think our cell phones could do a thousand more things in there. Oh yeah, for sure. They're <laughs> not shipped live and fully intact, so they'd be shipped in these containers that we can see here. Okay. And then they'd be fully constructed. At least the Ajax was constructed in here. The assembly building, the building out front with like the double green doors, that was built for the Nike Hercules, which was bigger. Of the Nike Ajax had a liquid fuel. Uh, it was highly corrosive, uh, very dangerous to handle, and the Nike soldiers would actually have to hoist the missiles onto the, onto this scaffolding here, mm -hmm. um, hoist it up, and then just pour it in. So if you got it on your skin, it's not good. Yeah, it's really bad. <laughs> it's no good. Probably cause instant cancer too. <laughs> Back in those days. Acted as acquisition radar. So that would scan the local airspace for mm -hmm. enemy aircraft. And if that detected enemy aircraft, it would transfer that information to the round radar device, okay. which is what would control the missiles. Oh, I see, I see. Now, I, in the movie I saw, I actually saw people looking through a site on that round one. Huh. And That's if you, possible. Yeah, and if you look up close, there's like two binocular things. Yeah, I think there's more... There's like a cover over it. I think there's more going on. Yeah, there, it's like some kind of human. Covered. You had to be engaged with it. Inter yeah. Um, Which is kind so, of surprising. Yeah, it's pretty interesting technology. And then those two trailers off to the side, really any trailer you see on site here was, was some sort of radar trailer. Mm -hmm. So inside were sort of like old tiny computers and things that would help them control. Um, the missiles from the ground. Okay. And all this radar equipment would not have been here. So we are at SF-88L. This okay. was strictly a launch site. So this is where the missiles were um, and the soldiers, most of them. And there was a separate SF-88 just for radar. Uh, the, the radar system had to be far enough away. Um, 
I think because the missiles were so fast, they had to be far enough in order to be able to triangulate um, to their target. Uh, but SF-88, the radar site was up on now Hill 88, that hill all the way up there. Mm -hmm. You can see like a mint green building up mm -hmm. top. Yeah. Um, you can hike there, it's about a two mile hike from Rodeo Beach. Um, but yeah, that would have been a completely separate radar site specifically for SF-88. Um, so there's a different radar site up there. Is that what you're saying? Well, there's, so like each, each Nike site had their own radar site. Okay, okay. So like SF-88 was up there, and this is SF-88L. Okay. And then the Marine Mammal Center, which you can see across the way, was actually another Nike missile site. Oh, okay. And that had a different radar site. I, see, I, I see. think it was on Hog Hill, but I'm not entirely sure, to be okay. honest. Okay. Yeah. And it's a pretty genius location. If you were here at 12.30 when we opened, it was pretty foggy. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't see that hill at all. Mm -hmm. um, so it's pretty well hidden. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> the fog. Kennels for sentry dogs. Okay. So security was of such high concern of the Nike missile sites that they were each armed with a four sentry dog unit. Uh. So these were German Shepherds or similar breed. And um, I believe SF-88 was the first Nike site in the Bay Area to get a sentry dog unit. And um, these dogs were basically acquired from all over the US and they underwent extensive training. And they were basically trained to listen to their, um, their assigned military police officer, their MP, and listen to only their MP. Mm -hmm. So they're basically designed to have one human friend and then attack everyone else. Um, <laughs> Lovely. So they, kind of, they kind of had a reputation for being scary because they were so well trained, so vicious. Mm -hmm. There are stories of soldiers, um, if the dogs ever got loose, the soldiers would kind of scatter to get out of harm's way. <laughs> and wow. occasionally the soldiers would be uh, recruited to help with target training for the dogs. So that meant um, being suited up in padding and then taken down by the dogs. Yeah. So they had kind of an interesting reputation, um, <laughs> given their extensive training and how powerful they were. Yeah. And ultimately, um, so when these dogs became too old to do this type of security work, uh, they were unfortunately put down. And um, when an MP left the service, they would try and match up that dog. Their dog was someone new, but if they couldn't find a good match, those dogs were unfortunately put down as well. Yeah. And yeah. Um, when the Nike missile program came to an end in 1974, the MPs at the time, they had years long relationships with their dogs and they wanted to keep them. They, so they ended up writing to the Congress people, they wrote petitions. Um, they did everything they could to keep those dogs in civilian life, but Gen unfortunately life. the military uh, was afraid of what might happen with these highly trained animals That's brutal. and the civilian life. Yeah. So unfortunately they suffered the same fate. Yeah. It's a pretty yeah. sad story. Yeah. 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 Like there's an, of course, like an outer fence that surrounds the whole Nike site, and then this, this inner fenced area, the exclusion area. So to enter this, you had to be, I think, in a pair, and you need permission. So I think mm. if you enter without permission, like you would, like be shot or something. <laughs> um, but the dogs would basically, their job was to patrol the perimeter of this fence. Oh wow. Yeah. Yeah. This is the launch site. Um, there's actually, this is, um, what we call. There's two magazines here. We're gonna go down into um, the A pit. There's also a B pit over there. Um, it's also working kind of, but it's not, it's basically a garage, a storage, like a workshop. Mm. Okay, okay. Um, so this is the only one that's kind of maintained for us to visit. Like I imagine this uh, hatch would be how you get out once, the, mm -hmm. once they're about to be launched. Yes. Yeah, so there were stairs and there was this hatch. This hatch goes directly oh, yes, into the um, control room. Going down. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Six on display here. 
Um, so this is an active site. They wouldn't actually leave one on the elevator like we do. They'd actually have three and three. And then when it came time to launch, two soldiers would come down and they would shoot one either side. They would push this in onto the elevator. As you can see, it moves pretty easily. This is like a few thousand pounds. Oh, wow. Yeah. They push onto the elevator, ride it up, push it onto the first launch pad, do some tinkering, get it set up to, to go. And then as that was happening, the next two soldiers would take the elevator down, push the next one on, um, ride it up, set it up, and then they would repeat this process until there were four missiles ready to go in each of the launch pads above. Um, yeah, so while we were down here, I'll point out a couple things. So, as I mentioned before, that little section that we saw on the Warhead building, this is what's on the Warhead. The Nike Hercules missile came in two types. There was a high explosive version, and there was a nuclear version. So, um, these were, again, defense missiles, not designed to travel very far. The Nike Ajax could travel about 30 miles, the Nike Hercules almost 90 miles. This one, would have been a high explosive, and we know this because of the rounded tip here. Mm -hmm. This one would have been nuclear, uh, and we know that by the pointy red tip. Mm -hmm. So this would have held a nuclear missile about two and a half times the power of one of these other bombs dropped by Japan. So that was enough to just eliminate a squadron in the sky, right? Yeah, to eliminate a huge fleet and also um, create such a powerful electromagnetic pulse that uh. if they didn't like blast planes out of the sky, they would just shut anything down in the sky. Yeah. Also, probably the local area would be deeply impacted as well. What are the red things for on the tips of those? I I don't know. I think they are just kind of tagged. Safety or something? Yeah. When they launch. Um, yeah. Let's, uh, and do you know the speed of this elevator? Is it really fast? Like on it's um, pretty slow. Aircraft well, carriers. We're, we're gonna. I'll, I'm gonna send it above ground right now. Oh, you are. So look at the speed. Oh, nice. Because um, aircraft carriers, they have, they have a fast elevator because they gotta get planes whoa. up. Whoa. So it's super fast. Yeah, because yeah, they go up really they fast. Oh, so this thing's still operational. It is. Yeah, oh. the elevator That's is cool. operational. <laughs> yeah, so we'll get to see that right now. Oh, um, I do have to blast the warning buzzer, just a heads up. <laughs> crazy. So actually, as far as elevator go, I would consider that pretty fast. You consider it fast? Yeah. Okay, cool. As far as, <laughs> man, that went up pretty quick. Slow, but I guess, yeah, I guess they're the things. And this is the room I was talking about. Um, the hatch goes into a room in the corner, and that's where the um, launch officer would be, and any soldiers still on site would have to be in that room. That was pretty neat, watching it go up. Yeah, so as I mentioned, there's four launch pads up here. The missile would first arrive, it would be pushed into that first launch. The second would be put there, the third there, here. Oh, so they, they're immediately locked on these rails mm -hmm. and they go, I see. Yeah, so similar to how I pushed that one down below. Yeah. Um, it's all designed to just slide on out all the way to the, the launch pad. And those are launch pads there, right there? Yeah, okay. those orange sort of cones. Yeah. Those are each launch pads. 
and the elevator was a launch pad as well. And while that was happening here, the same thing would be happening in the A pit. The Nike missile sites would have been among the first targets. So if they had to launch them from here, they expected to die? Yes. Wow. Because the enemy would bomb. Right. It typically, um, something they typically did when they stationed soldiers at Nike sites was station them not where they were from. So like if you grew up in Marin County, they wouldn't station you at a Nike site here. Because that might, you know, knowing that you are a target, Mm -hmm. The Nike Hercules was only designed to travel about 90 miles. So if they were going to fire this missile and detonate it, it was likely going to be in U.S. territory or yeah. people in on our land, mm. um, in our country. So you could argue that having these nuclear defensive missiles was overkill and maybe not necessary. And it ultimately cost upwards of like seven trillion dollars so it's like an extremely expensive military well, if you think about the amount of warheads they would have had to have too yeah ready to go it's something i can't even fathom <laughs> yeah. nuclear warheads i mean that's crazy yeah well and then on the flip, right it's strictly defensive and then on the flip side um you could argue that having these extremely powerful missiles in place and um kind of on display to the soviet union Exactly. This having this here, even though it's very expensive and would have been very destructive, you could argue having this here is what ultimately deterred um, World War Three. Wow. So very interesting history. And it's kind of a tough question. You could, you could kind of ask yourself, huh, like, was the Nike missile program good? Was it bad? And even with hindsight, it's hard to say. Um, but it's an interesting history, and it's we're fortunate that we have this site here now that we can tell this story. Because as we know, history tends to repeat itself. Yeah. So having this history here, tangibly, we can learn from it and um, hopefully be informed going forward. Was there a particular reason in 1974 it was decommissioned? They just didn't feel the threat anymore? Or technology advanced? Or... Both of those things, okay. yes. So the threat wasn't as imminent. Technology had advanced. So um, this was ultimately obsolete. Yeah. Uh, around that time is when intercontinental ballistic missiles right. became a thing. And the Hercules missiles were about 99.7% effective at taking out their target of a plane. But when it came to the ICBMs, the Hercules missile was only about 8% effective. Yeah. So ultimately, what was it? 99% that was pretty, pretty good. Pretty accurate, yeah. yeah. It was like pretty wild. Um, For the time? And... Yeah, it just wasn't, wasn't worth it financially as well. So lots of different reasons it came to an end. And wow. um, when the program came to an end in 1974. Um, the Golden Gate National Recreation Area was actually already a park. Mm -hmm. So um, this park is turning 50 years old this October. Um, so it was founded in 1972. So people were, people were out here in the hills of the headlands recreating and enjoying the beach and like hiking and stuff while there were still nuclear missiles tucked in the hills. Oh, wow. So it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty interesting history. That could have been me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was here in the 70s and 80s, but I don't know how early. Yeah. So yeah, that pretty much concludes my tour. Um, awesome. If you'd like to hang around, I'm going to go down below and lower it. So yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. 
That was real. That was the highlight. Watching that thing for go. Sure. Up. Yeah, that's like yeah. the best part of the tour, for sure. <laughs> I'll be back. And if you have any other questions, I can answer them when I come back. Okay. That was uh, very impressive. <laughs> you don't see that every day. That was awesome. Speechless. So thanks for coming on my journey at the Nike Missile Site. And I'll see you next time.